Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, optogenetics and it's really a, a review of this emerging team that I'm going to give here. So it's mostly the work of others that I like, that I selected here. And uh, I will tell you what it is. And briefly, the idea is that uh, we saw during this course that you can use light to see what's going on in the cell. And I will show you that you can also use light to activate stuff in the cell, to really control and uh, perturb the uh, events that are taking place in the cell. So just to introduce optogenetics, actually it was at the beginning uh, a term that was coming from neurobiology. And uh, it was called optogenetics because it was a way to activate neurons with light. And uh, this is like one of the famous guys that developed optogenetics. And what you see here is a little mouse that has a little lead on the head. And uh, if you see when the lead is off, the mouse is wandering around normally. And as soon as you turn on the lead, the mouse starts to walk around. So you can really remote control uh, the mouse here. If you look back to the movie, here the, the mouse is normal, behaving normally. And then you shine the blue light with this little lead on top of the head. You see, and it starts to move. So uh, that was really transformative for the field of uh, neurobiology. And I would like to uh, show today that it might be as transformative for the, actually cell biology as well. So just how, how that works, like how you can make that. The idea behind that was to use some natural light sensitive protein uh, that are actually doing some jobs in cells. And uh, what you saw with the previous movie actually is the, was coming from an alga, so a single uh, cell organism that has uh, just one cell and two flagella. And this alga is able actually to do phototaxis, so to react uh, to light and actually to move away from light. So if you have a gradient of light that comes from the side here, you will see that the alga will move and uh, actually move on the other side here. As you can see with this movie, maybe again, you shine light and you just accumulate on the other side. So how this algae can do that? Actually, they do that thanks to a little, what is called an A-spot, which is actually a cluster of uh, transmembrane uh, receptors that are light-gated, which means that when these receptors get light, they just open and let ions flow through, and then that is used as a signal for actually to drive the flagella uh, motion here. And uh, the idea of optogenetics for, for neurobiology was to actually take the gene that I code this light-gated receptors, which is called channel rhodopsin, and uh, to insert them in specific neurons, thanks to promoters that are specific for given neurons, <coughs> such that only this uh, subset of neurons that controls a given behavior, so for example, in the first movie, this behavior of the, the, the mouse running, uh, will be activated when you shine light, and uh, then you will control the behavior that way. So it's a bit like electrodes, but then you use light to activate uh, neurons. So that was for neurobiology, but uh, actually the same idea uh, has been developed uh, for cellular activities. And the idea is a bit the same, so it's that you take some, it's not a, uh, a channel that is going to be light-gated, but another kind of proteins that will be light-gated, and such that the absorption of light will not give rise to emission, like in fluorescent microscopy, microscopy, but to some kind of change of conformation that will drive some reactive processes afterwards. And uh, so this is something that has been really emerging the last, I would say, seven, eight years now. And uh, it's really increasing uh, fast, very fast. Like ma most of the cellular processes have been put under the control of light. And I have to say that it's quite easy. This is what I will try to convince you, is that you don't need a super high device to do that. You know, everybody that is using, doing fluorescent microscopy can do that as well. Uh, it's just a bit of molecular biology, and the cell is actually doing all the job because the, all the system is genetically encoded. That's the main advantage of that. And actually, so this field is, is, is emerging. There's no real name for cell biology, so this is why people call it, and there was even like an uh, uh, EMBO practical question on that, on non-neuronal optogenetics. So, um, it's optogenetics, but not for neurobiology, for cell biology. So it's a bit weird to define a field by negative, but that's the best uh, what the people could do. So um, after this introduction, I will tell you uh, how you can actually control cellular processes, subcellular processes. And there are several ways you can do that. As I say, you know, you use this genetically encoded protein that's sensitive to light. And uh, here you have some examples. The first one is actually getting a domain within a protein that will do like a kind of allosteric changes, or like revealing, for example, the binding site for effect dense infectants. So that is one protein that is genetically encoded. Uh, some of the systems rely, and I will spend most of the time on these systems that are called the light-gated demerization system, 
what the idea is to shine light on one of these proteins that will become reactive for a partner. So basically, you induce the dimerization of two proteins with light. And here, uh, an example of a movie like doing that is the uh, organelle positioning. So basically, you can shine light. I will have a better movie uh, afterwards. But the idea is that you can manipulate organelle positioning with light in doing that. And I will spend a bit of time on the clustering, because this is something that is emerging even more recently, and that seems to have very good promises in uh, cell biology. Yeah. So the movie are not working here, but uh, this is, for example, here, a movie where you can see that you can actually cluster protein in the cell to basically, in that case, inactivate some activators of the membrane, uh, roughly, in that case. Okay, so I will start with the first, this light-gated demonization, explaining you a bit more how it works. Uh, so the idea is, uh, as I said, you are going to form a complex between two proteins, going to light. And the whole idea is that you are going to fuse one of these partners, uh, that they might raise to an anchor, so something that you target, a subcellular compartment. And this is an example here in the East, where you can actually target almost all compartments of the cell, intracellular compartment, the plasma membrane, the nucleus, the nucleolus, the, uh, like any kind of uh, structures that you have in the cell. And here you see the image before and after, uh, well, after like before shining light and after shining light. Uh, I don't know if it's clear, but you have to focus on, for example, here for the NLS one. It's outside before you, you, you shine light, and then it gets in. And basically, you can relocalize very quickly. It takes few seconds to really relocalize this, this protein here. So you can do that. And for example, this is uh, one example I like, where you can actually use that to uh, take some organelles, in that case, for example, it is shown here is a perixosome, and then make a light-gated demerization system that will anchor it to some motor protein. So in that case, it's kinesin 5, and you see that at the beginning, the perixosome are quite in the middle of the cell, and as soon as you shine light, you shoot them out to the outer membrane. Yeah. And you can do that locally by shining light just at these different places here. You will send this organelle to the periphery uh, with a subcellular resolution. Yeah. So for this uh, light gated demerization system, you have uh, several systems. And basically, there are two families. Uh, one which is uh, blue light activating. They rely on cryptochromes or love domains in general. And the one that are red activating, that are based on cytochromes, uh, mostly. So uh, I put them here on, the, uh, on this lens scale for uh, wavelengths. So you can see that actually one of the problems, and that's, that's an issue, but uh, of course, we have many fluorescent protein is that, for example, if you have a blue system to activate, that means that either the CFP, GFP, or EFP, you cannot use it anymore, because if you image, you are going to activate. So which means that to have reporters, you need to couple that with a cherry, or for example, this new infrared personal protein, if you want to have two colors to observe. The opposite for red, you need to use this uh, blue activated protein here. So there are, ni there are nice reviews about it, so we'll not spend that much time, but these are the uh, three main systems. One is called the Phytochrome B, I will talk a bit about it. And I will spend most time talking about the CRY2, which is something that is activated with blue light. So you shed blue light, and then it will open an active confirmation for this cryptochrome based protein that will bind to its partner, which is called CIBM. C -A -B -M. So you have all these details in this review, you know the wavelengths. Uh, so this is kind of summarized here. One thing I want to mention is that actually the, the power of light that you need to use is very dim. You don't need, if you can image GFP, you, have, you are above the threshold that you need for activating this protein. So very little light is sufficient. These systems have been evolved by natural evolution to be very sensitive to light. So you don't need to shine a, a lot of light to do that. Uh, so how you do that then, uh, in the movie I'll show you, again, if you can do fluorescence imaging, you can do activation. So for example, this blue activating system, if you image the GFP, you are going to activate. So you can use any kind of fluorescent microscope to do global activation, where you will control the timing by just ch choosing the time at which you image the GFP, that would be the time zero for activation. But also you can do that, uh, that's what for the temporal control. You can do that also locally with that subcellular control by using any kind of microscopy that use pattern illumination. So I will mention a bit the DMD, which is the digital near mirror devices, like in this uh, uh, projector here. Uh, you can use the FRAP system with very little power. That's also a way to activate locally. But you can even use the diaphragm of your microscope to just focus on a little spot. So there are very easy solutions, cheap solutions for that. Uh, if you want to do something out of the microscope, there are plenty of solutions also, using Arduino, for example, to build your own system with LEN, 
to put the, the stuff in the incubator and let it itself for I don't know, 24 hours to see long-term activation, potentiation. So uh, this is really easy in a, in a way to do that. Uh, so then what you can do with this uh, demerization system, and this is something we spend quite a lot of time on, is that we need to manipulate the protein distribution with a subcellular resolution. Imagine if you have a cell and you want to accumulate some protein in one side, for example, if you're interested in cell polarity, or whatever mechanism, or like we saw with this uh, T cell, for example, uh, that will really take synapses, that is something very local at the cell, uh, similar scale, so if you were to do the same somehow, uh, it, it would be interesting to manipulate with a subcellular resolution. And uh, this is something that is actually using this strategy again, two protein that binds, that form dimer. But now one of the anchor, uh, one of the protein is anchored to the plasma membrane, okay, and serve as a uh, targeting spot for the other one. And in the movie I'm going to show, uh, what we are going to see is that you have this cryptochrome, uh, cry 2 here, that is going to be fused for the moment just to a fluorescent precursor. Just see what's going on. Uh, M-cherry in that case. And initially it's in the cytosol, so this is a side view of the cell here. And we look in turf mode, so we heard about turf uh, yesterday a lot, so I will not mention that, but what we're going to do is then activate with a FRAP system in that case, so there will be a cone of blue light that are going to activate this little uh, protein in the cytosol, they're going to diffuse, and then bind to the plasma membrane, where they have their partner. And since you look in turf, you are going to see this recruitment to the basal membrane of the cell of this fluorescent protein. Yeah. And this is what you see here, you have two cells in turf, so you see just the basal <coughs> local side of the cell that is in contact with the cover slip. And we activated this region here, the red region. And uh, that's just why that the movie is going to loop. Uh, as we activate, we are going to see that you have like uh, molecules that appear, which exactly they appear in the, in the film of the turf. And you see them that you accumulate. Every time you shine a little pulse of light, you have a batch of these molecules that are being recruited, until you come to a steady state. And the steady states correspond to the time at which the amount of protein that you recruit per pulse of light is going to equal the amount of uh, dimer that dissociate because there is a dissociation of the dimer and that is very nice because actually if it was not the case then by diffusion it will spread everywhere on the cell so this actually this deactivation here this dissociation of the dimer is required if you want to have something local uh, and then so this is the steady state is that you recruit and complex dissociate over time and you see that even if you look a bit away from the cell you see that the, you have a slight decay that tells you that actually some of the signal that you see away is going to be uh, moving to this side. So you really manipulate the whole protein distribution and accumulate on one side of it. So you, you know, I guess you understand the, the, the principles. So I will not go into all the detail about the numbers. What you need to remember is that uh, the more frequently you, 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 you make a pulse, or you image in GFP, for example, if you make an image of GFP every second, you are going to reach the maximum amount you can get, but you can tune that amount by lowering the amount of uh, uh, the time in between each frame to the GFP, for example. And you can achieve different steady state value just by changing the frequency of acquisition. Yeah. And the typical time of, uh, of this acquisition frequency, you should think about this dissociation time. If it takes three minutes, in that case for the CRY2 uh, CIBN dimer to dissociate, it means that three minutes is your time scale. If you're half of it, uh, you are basically about half of the level, and that's giving you really the time scale that you should consider for that. Uh, and then, uh, in terms of space, I uh, will not go too much into the detail, but the idea is that when you activate, uh, basically the molecule, the, the complex, still diffuses a bit on the plasma membrane. And actually, what's important for the spatial resolution is going to be the ratio between this diffusion and the time scale again of dissociation. Because you know the complex will move until it will dissociate, and then you can go back to a new cycle. So, what's going to limit your resolution is a number, and this is just the square root of the diffusion coefficient and this time of in, the, in the bound state. And in that case, it's about 5 micron. So this is important because if you have a cell that is less than 5 micron, okay, there will be no, nothing local you can achieve. If it's a big system, like 100 or 200 microns, it will be very precise. Yeah. And this is just to say that actually many biological systems, cells like these gradients in organisms, or even like subcellular gradients within the cell, are functioning the same way. It's like diffusion and then degradation. It's the same <coughs> idea. So, actually, this, this tells you also this, this length scale that when you, for example, you illuminate on the cell a little round spot here, basically the recruitment is not just localized here, but it will basically blur a bit out of your region of activation with an exponentially decaying profile. 
but that is very stable over time. This is like a, a, an hour of movie, and you see that you have a gradient that is pretty stable in the cell, that you can maintain dyna dynamically by recruiting constantly this, uh, this pool of molecules. So that's just about the manipulation of proteins, but now what you want to do is that we do something in the cell, not just basically move protein. And uh, what uh, has been developed a lot is actually the control of, and this is one example, of signaling through GTPases. And uh, here I will tell you what is the trick to activate signaling uh, based on this recruitment. Uh, but first of all, you need to know what is a GTPase. So the GTPase is a small uh, protein that is anchored to the plasma membrane, and that shuttle between an off state and GDP bound, and the on state where it's GTP bound. And uh, basically cycling is happening from to turn to activators, that are called the guanine exchange factors, and the gap that basically does the other way around. And the, the molecules that are activated, they activate it all the time. They cycle through that. And how to control this autogenetics? So the idea here, uh, you always need the little tricks, basically to basically go for a system that just dimerizes to something that we control signaling. It depends then on uh, which kind of cellular processes you want to look at. In that case, the idea is to take this, take this gap here, and this gap is a multi-domain protein. And one of these domains is the catalytic one that does the activation. And actually, this catalytic domain here is, uh, uh, has to be on the membrane, on the plasma membrane, to be active. If it's in the cytosol, the concentration is too low on the membrane, and nothing happens. So the idea is to truncate this gap, to gen, take out only the catalytic domain, and then fuse it to this uh, demyelination system. So that when you shine light, you are going to get this gap on the plasma membrane and activate these DPSs. So that's how it works. Basically, you recapitulate this membrane localization and activate the endotinous pool of GTPases. So uh, the GTPases are three canonical ones uh, that are very important for cell polarity, cell morphology, and morphodynamics to control the cytoskeleton of the cell. Uh, they are called RAP1, CD42, we saw an example in the talk this morning, and row a which is mainly responsible for the contractility. And here I just give you like two movies to show you how it works. So the first one is, for example, activating CD42 locally. So you have a cell here initially. And we're going to activate in this little uh, region. And you can look in turf about the recruitment. So it's nice because you see what you're doing. You see a bit the signal, that you're the biochemical signal that you're uh, 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 sending to the cell. And you see that here the cell responds by polarizing and starting to migrate in the direction uh, of the activation. So you can really control here, the remotely control the migration of the cell by localizing CC42 in a given spot of activity. Uh, you can do the same by uh, playing with contractivity. So this is an example with raw activation of raw A, and you see that at the places where you activate, actually the cells start to contract and shrink, because actually you activate the atomyosin contractility uh, at that position here. And what is fun is actually the cells start to move on the other side. So if I put my laser pointer on the front of the cell, you see that you could drive migration again, but from the back here. Okay, so that's kind of what the, the stuff that you can do. And uh, again, I think it's pretty easy because the only thing, for example, for an experiment like that, that you have to do, is just transfect the cell with two plasmids. Okay, so this is not that, that hard. I mean, as, as soon as you can transfect cells, of course. Uh, but there are some stuff that you need to know. And uh, after like working with people, I think it's nice to make some comment about uh, the system if you really want to use them, what you should be aware of. Again, it's very easy, but sometimes you know you try it yourself and it doesn't work, and you don't know why. So this is why I'm going to try to explain a bit about it. Uh, so the first thing is I would like to comment is about this, if you want to do something subcellular, like a spatial resolution, something that would be like localized in the cell. Uh, one of the things I told you is that there is this kind of length scale that is related to the diffusion and, and, and the activation that limits the precision at which you can uh, do something local in the cell. And uh, so if you, if you have a problem with that, like you're working with small cells, for example, one way is actually to move to another one, which is called the Fitocom B system. This one is very nice because you can actually activate with a uh, 650 uh, nanometers wavelength, and you can also inactivate with infrared light. So that way you can shine activating light on one side, and inactivating light, like bath the cell with inactivating light everywhere else, and then you will, be, will have a very precise uh, local activation. So I have to say that this system is a bit hard to make it work. Uh, I spent four years trying to make it work, it was never working. But now I made it work, so I know exactly the tricks. So if you, if you really want to do something very local, please ask me, I will tell you the, the few tricks that you need to know. I will not have the time to comment here, but um, this is one example here that was taken from uh, one of the seminar publications, where they use actually 
this digital micro mirror to send a complementary pattern of light, so activating light here and inactivating light uh, on the on the other pattern, and they use this game of light Conaway uh, uh, pattern just for the fun, and you see that on inter that you actually you can do something very local. So again, this one is a bit hard to make it work. I think a, a, a good option is maybe to use one of these new dimmer razors. Uh, and the one that is really promising is called Eileen. So I really encourage you to, to also look for this one that was developed by Brian Kuhlman. He's a very good guy developing these tools here. And in that case, the, it's, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like the Quieto system I was showing for this membrane localization. But now the uh, lifetime of the complex, instead of being three minutes, it's 30 seconds. So which means that actually the length scale is much shorter. And uh, this is in the mammalian cell here, a membrane a recruitment, plasma membrane recruitment assay. Well, actually, they were spelling the, lighter, uh, the letters of eyelid, and you see that it's pretty sharp and precise. So it's a very good system to, like, with very simple uh, system to uh, achieve a good resolution here. So something that uh, now I want to say is about the, uh, the chemistry that is behind that. So if you did a bit of chemistry, that would be trivial for you, but uh, it was not for me, so I want to take a bit of time here. Actually, usually when these people use these dimmer razors, uh, one of the problems is that you go in the microscope, uh, you say, okay, I'm going to try to recruit to the plasma membrane. So you do an image, then you activate, you do another image, nothing happens. You say, ah, what happened? So then you are stuck, you don't know what was going on. And in general, that will be always related to the problem of expression level of your uh, set of proteins. So that's maybe the only thing you should be aware of uh, when you work with these uh, dimmer razors, is the, the, the equation of it. So why, why that? Uh, let me just do a very first recall about what are uh, chemical kinetics, like first order kinetics. Uh, and I use this example here where you have like, let's say, some binding site for a protein that is red and that is expressed in the range of 10 nanomolar. Okay, so the 10 nanomolar is relatively low. So if you have a KD, so the KD is the reaction, uh, this is the number that tells you at which concentration the reaction happens. And uh, a KD in the nanomolar range means that actually if you are above this number, the, most of the reaction will take place. So if the KD is in nanomolar range and you are above 10 nanomolar, then you know that you are going to be mostly born. Yeah. So usually the people, they are that with this kind of graphics, where you see this here, this axis is the concentration of your red protein here, and that will be the amount of complex that you have. And the KD is just actually the number, the value of the concentration of this protein uh, at which you, you get half of the uh, reaction being taking place. So usually people show that in a love scale. So in love scale, actually, instead of having this linear enzymatic reaction, you get something like look, that looks like a sine wave. And basically, the switch here is just like here nothing is born, and here everything is born, and that shift around the key. Yeah. So of course, then if you are above uh, uh, this uh, this value here, uh, it means that uh, like if you are in the minimolar and the key is nanomolar, you are way way above. Like everything is born, and then so you become saturated by the binding sites themselves. The other way around, if you have a KD that is in millimolar and you have a very low concentration, now you're in that range here, nothing happens. And now the whole idea of, uh, of the genetic system is actually to shift the KD of the uh, binding between the two partners. So in the dark state, you will have a given KD. Let's say uh, in the millimolar uh, range here, whereas you express yourself in the micromolar range. And then uh, you're going to do like optogenetic activation and you're going to switch this KD from a given value, like millimolar to micromolar, for example. And then, this is how you're going to change and shift the system to non-bound to, un to the bound state here. So if you think about this, this graphic here, where you have a given KD in the dark, a given KD in the light, what you want is actually to express your protein right in the middle here. So that you know that in the dark, it's not bound, and under light, it will be bound. So it does mean that there is a range at which it works. You know. So in general, so when you do the experiment, it doesn't work. It's two possibilities. Either you express too much of protein, so it's already born in the dark, so you don't see any difference before and after. Or, uh, actually, the expression is too low, and even if you shine light, the concentration is too, is too low, and then nothing happens, even with light. Yeah. So that's why you need to, to, to tune a bit the concentration. It's quite large. In general, the fold change here are large. It's like uh, several hundred folds, so you don't need to fine-tune uh, the concentration. But you need to know if you're in the micromolar range, minimolar range, nanomolar range. You need to know at least by a free order of magnitude the, the level at which you work. And uh, that's kind of a paper that describes all these properties. Uh, you have the references, so I, I would not comment that on much. So actually, uh, a nice way to see about this, uh, all these uh, dimerizing systems, so there are several of them, the ID that talk about it, the Cry2, Peter Kongi, 
Uh, and there are actually other ones that I didn't talk about, the, the tulip, for example, one. Uh, a nice way is to represent them on a scale bar of concentration. And then you have the dot here, this is a KD in the dark, that's a KD in the light. And then you see the range at which the system works. And of course, the bigger it is, the best it is, because it means that uh, the full change will be the, the higher. So that's a nice way, if you look at this kind of publication, to see which one to choose, given the expression level you expect for your protein. And actually, there's a large variant of them. No, they cover like the minimolar range, <coughs> micromolar range, nano, so they're called nano, micro, mini for this, for this name. And uh, you, so you have a huge bench of them. So actually, you just need to choose the good one uh, at, at the beginning. And just to give you, so if you have no idea about which one to choose, uh, actually, when you overexpress a protein with a, like, uh, a, a usual promoter, like a CME promoter, you end up in the micromolar range. Okay, that's a very, the strong promoter. If you are like a low promoter, it's more in the, na in the uh, nanomolar, in the nanomolar range, 100 of nanomolars. And if you don't to do like even like endogenous tagging with CRISPR system, for example, then you have to consider that actually, when you look at the, ex the expression <coughs> level in real cells, how much they are expressed, uh, except few proteins that express a lot, like actin or uh, ribosomal uh, protein, that are many, of course, largely expressed. Actually, 90% of the uh, proteins expressed in the cell are within the femtomolar range and the one nanomolar range. Okay, so if you are showing this kind of graphics here, where you have like GFP of express around that place here, you have to think that endogenous protein might be here. Okay, so we are not yet uh, to that point in terms of uh, system. So I will recommend overexpress it. Uh, of course, that's uh, bulk concentration, but if you work with membrane, for example, or nanodomains, then the effective concentration might be completely different. So you have to be aware also that the protein that you look at, where it is, if it's on a 2D surface or not, it could change the effective concentration by a huge factor. Okay, so now I will give you some uh, uh, recent advance, you know, how people use that in biology and what they do with that. So it's, it's more like a little tool, uh, very quickly. Uh, one thing that I like is actually people uh, started to do that in multicellular organisms. So here you have an example in the Drosophila embryo uh, using this cry 2 cbn system. Uh, what the idea here is to bring to the plasma membrane a phosphatase that is playing a role in uh, contractility uh, uh, of the cell that basically plays on the PIP2 and PIP3 uh, exchanges. And what you see here, I'll just show you the movie, huh, that when you shine like a pattern uh, of light right in the middle of you, you completely mess up the tissue dependence. And instead of having this nice convergence of the tissue for the gasolation, you just completely break down uh, this problem. Uh, so this is a very nice work from people, the Stefano De Rentis group in, the, in Heidelberg, in the EMBL, and also they, uh, they have a nice work coming out using the contractivity, so rho A activity, to basically fold the embryo with optogenetics. So they can really uh, fold the embryo as they want, just using contractivity, and make morphogenesis uh, by themselves. Like, why them with optogenetics? Uh, another recent development that is nice is actually a reverse system, which is called the Z, uh, ZDK, where in that case, when you shine light, you don't make a dimer, but you dissociate the dimer. And uh, this is a very important way to actually release, at a very precise point, a protein in the cytosol that will have a function. And uh, here, for example, the idea is you can uh, use the mitochondria and membrane to, to, uh, as, a, as a storage place. Uh, for the protein of your interest, and then when you are going to shine light, this will dissociate, so this is on the mitochondria, you shine light, and then boom, it's released on the, everywhere in the cell. So you, have, you can have a very precise time for uh, uh, release of the protein here. Yeah. And uh, one example of that is the release of a VAF2, which is a GEF uh, involved in uh, CC42 and ROC1, uh, plus a tie uh, protrusive activity of the cell, and you see that you can really tightly control that process with that. And this is also used a lot for uh, very tight control of gene expression. So I haven't talked about gene expression, but there is a whole film uh, also of optogenetics working on the control of gene expression by light. And uh, one of the issues is that you want to have something very tight, so no expression in the dark. And one way is actually to use a combination of NLS, NLS that is photoactivable, that can go in the nucleus like a transcription factor, with something that is tightened on the microbiome in the dark as well. So then it's, it's, it's really a way to, to control with a very almost no leaky activity in the dark, the activity of a gene. Um, so now I switch to, uh, that was more for dimension, to oligomerization and clustering. And we see that uh, there are nice uh, stuff also with that. And uh, actually, so this oligomerization is something that you need to know when you work with Cry2, because this cryptochrome 2 has a tendency to make oligomers. Even a bit in the dark, if it's a very high concentration, 
But this is also like triggered by light. And there is a whole paper that looks at this property of oligomerization. Uh, so it's a very bit problematic because when you shine light and form oligomers, you don't know what, how you control your biological events there. But actually, you can use it to, uh, to control uh, processes that rely on oligomerization themselves. Uh, and for that, you don't even need to have the partner, the C1 partner. And one example I like a lot is this uh, FGFR uh, activation with this demerization and oligomerization. So the idea is to take, so this is the, the, re, the, re, the transformant receptor for the uh, growth factors uh, that the cell receive from the outside. And the idea that, that they use, normally this is activated by ligands that triggers the dimerization of the receptors. And upon dimerization, you have phosphorylations of the intracellular phase. Uh, domains on this receptor. And the idea here is to cut all the extracellular domains, you get it out, you keep the intracellular domains, and then you fuse it to cry to, oh no, no, no partner. And just thanks to this demerization system, actually, by chaining light, you are going to form these dimers and many oligomers, and that will be sufficient for the phosphorylated receptors. And what you see in this movie here is that, that are fibroblasts that are prospected with this system, and now they are becoming sensitive to, to light, and they are doing phototaxis. In the sense that they, you know that light light is shining in this circle here, and they, 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 they like this place, you know, because here they receive a growth factor. So they, they can really sense the light and go and stack all together here. It's a beautiful way to control to control that. Um, another way, so that's ready to activate. Another way, so uh, this quite to oligomerization has been even improved to make uh, <coughs> more efficient clustering. And there's a variant that is called quite to olig that forms a really big oligomers by aggregation of the protein. Uh, so this is like the, uh, the normal cry 2 that may form some uh, cluster, but you cannot see them by eyes. They are too small. And with this enhanced cry 2 here, you form big clusters. And actually, so you can look at several publications about these uh, big clusters here. They can be used, for example, to inactivate the protein with a very acute temporal control. In the sunlight, all your protein is aggregated, so then it cannot be activated anymore. So it's a very nice way to to silence the activity of a protein, but not with ACRNA that takes time, and then uh, that could, could really rewire the whole network. Here it's very uh, on-off, uh, off-on uh, control. And it can be used also, for example, to study protein interaction, because if you want to know if two proteins interact, you can cluster one and see whether or not the other one clusters. And that tells you whether or not they are interacting here. And uh, last, uh, so one of the problems with this uh, oligomization here is that actually they form aggregates. So it's, it's a bit like a prion like, it's, it's a very big aggregate that are uh, solid kind of structures, okay? And uh, they take time to dissociate. And they can even stay for very long. It takes maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes. Sometimes you see them one hour after. And there's one beautiful uh, system that is based uh, on phase transition. Uh, let me just show you the movie. So the movie here, they express these things. I will comment on that. And what they change here is the laser settings. And you will see that as soon as the, that they cross the threshold in laser settings, like uh, around 40 or 45, you will see that actually you are going completely to change the distribution of the protein. So if you look at 45 boom, you just phase separate the, uh, the, the cytosolic, initially cytosolic protein here. And the idea here is this is a physics called phase transition. It's like oil in water. You know, if you put oil in the water, you see that it's from droplets. Uh, because uh, you know the oil likes more to be in oil than water. And here is, is exactly the same. You, know, you have something that is more like water-like at the beginning, and with light, you can turn it into oil-like uh, 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 molecules. And the idea here is that actually they, use, they fuse just the quite in the normal quite that has this little tendency to make self-interaction with disorder chain of protein that also wants to be all together. This one, you find them, for example, in this ribosomal compartment that form with mRNA, these kind of granules that you see in the cells here. And, but here, by themselves, they are not enough. They cannot really uh, cluster all together. But if you add on top of that this quite that is light density, and that you can tune with light the amount of cell interaction, you can cross this barrier of uh, phase separation. And what is nice here is that actually there is exchange. So you, you know these droplets that you see here? If you frap them, you will see very quick recovery. Okay, so they are highly dynamic structures. So you can use that, for example, for kinases. If you want to increase the rate of kinesis activity, you put all the kinesis together, they will have a huge uh, local concentration that will process uh, the, uh, the, pod, the substrate very, very efficiently, but also they can exchange. So if they want to go out and then go in the nucleus to clear some gene activation, this is not something that, it's not a piece of junk in the cell. This is really an active uh, study. 
So, uh, in the few minutes that are left, uh, I will just now uh, give you uh, one, one little application that we do in the lab, just to see what you can do also with this, uh, the, this uh, optogenetic system. And uh, I will very quickly give you the idea. So we use actually this optogenetic activation of progenetic cases I was speaking about. And one thing that we are interested in the lab is the cell migration, so how cell migrates and decide where to go, you know, left, right, front, in the, in the complex environment. And uh, one of the observations that was made previously uh, by some people here is that actually when you look at uh, this GTPase activity in cells, uh, migrating cells, you see the canonical picture is that you have CDC42 and RAC1, these two GTPases that are active in the front of the cell, so the, the one that is protruding in mesenchyma migration, and rho A mostly in the back of the cell that has ensured the contractility of the cell. And actually when you look now quantitatively about this gradient, what they look like in, in the cells, uh, actually, RAC1 presents a very uh, shallow gradient that extends a lot in the cell, whereas CDC42 is very sharp and very sharply localized in the tip of the cell. And uh, when you look at this gradient, you know, CDC42 is very really sharp, as you see here, and RAC1 presents this kind of bumpy uh, gradient here. And uh, I really like gradients, me, myself, I was working on uh, morphogen gradients before, so as a physicist, I like to understand how this kind of pattern can emerge in cells, you know, what are the mechanisms that make this pattern emerge in the cell. And uh, looking at that, I, we wanted to know what are the mechanisms that shape in the cell, how they are, how, 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 which mechanisms are shaped, the diffusion, abduction, uh, local activity, all of that. Uh, so this is why I was interested in that. And something also that is very important here is that this gradient that you see, uh, they are uh, really autonomous entities in the sense that uh, it's not because the cell is in the gradient, like doing chemotaxis, that this internal gradient will mirror the external gradient. This gradient, you know, if you uh, put them in a gradient of chemicals outside or uniform stimulation, they have exactly the same shape. So it's really that there is a cell intrinsic system that shape and establish this gradient. And then the idea that, that would make this polarized, polarized system, the cell polarity, and then the sensing machinery will bias this, uh, this, this uh, internal uh, polarized uh, machinery uh, to, to make the cell move directionally here. So uh, we're interested in these gradients here, and the question that we ask is like, what are the mechanisms that shape them, that shape those gradients, and also what are the role? Why RAC1 is more extended than CC42 very localized here? And I will speak mostly about that, and how, to, how we uh, try to answer the question was actually by uh, engineering gradient. So the idea is to use uh, this autogenic system to make gradient of light within the cell of these GTPases and see then what the cell do. Uh, do. Like, you know, if I put something very sharp or very shallow, uh, how that will affect the uh, migrating properties of the cell. So to make this gradient here, actually we use a, a DMD device. Uh, so it's a very cheap solution that we have. Actually it's exactly again like this video projector that you have here. This is an array of micro mirrors that like, have two positions. They are either they reflect light or they don't. And uh, they flip very quickly. And you can g get grayscale level of uh, uh, activation by just frequency of flipping of this mirror here. And the idea is that you, you take this video projector here and you plug it into the computer, into the microscope. And, I mean, it's okay a bit of fine tuning, but uh, it's almost like that. You, know. you just plug that into the microscope. And then you can shine a pattern of light in the microscope. So uh, actually, if you want to take uh, you can take a movie from YouTube, put it in the, in the projector, you look in the microscope, and then you see your movie on the set. It's pretty fun. You have to do it <laughs> once. <laughs> Nothing related to science, but fun. Uh, that's something, yeah, we, we, did, we, can, we did a demo where actually we were taking, a, uh, with the webcam, the people, for the demo for the, uh, for the system, uh, we were taking a webcam, filming the people with the webcam, and then projecting on the DMD and on the sample video. So the people were coming to the microscope, looking inside, and they were seeing themselves, you know, looking in the microscope, but uh, on a micron scale uh, image, you know. <laughs> it, took the, it took some time before we realized that that's you in the microscope. You know. Okay, so then you can do like gradient of recruitment. Uh, here, like if you shine like uh, something that spans half of the cell, basically your recruitment that spans half of the cell, and this is the sharpest we can do because of this limit of diffusion I was speaking about before. And, uh, but you can really get like very nice gradient of different slopes here. Yeah. Um, and then, so we combine that with uh, a system to really see what was going on about migration. And if you take random cells, the problem is that they always have some wear shape, they're already migrating in the direction. So we wanted to have a very good control of time zero, you know, like a naive, stupid cell that will be wrong and not doing anything. So for that, we use this uh, technique that is uh, classical to do like uh, confinement of cells uh, on, on the substrate. 
you use a repellent, so the cell cannot adhere. You burn that repellent, so the cell adheres no, on, on whatever shape you like. In, the, in that case, we took a brown shape. And then we had there's a strategy where you can use a little chemical that will basically make all these repellents become adhesive. So then you know time zero. Okay, time zero, the cell now can adhere in, anywhere. And at the same time, we put a gradient of light. And the idea is to see then how it bias this uh, initial vibration steps here. Uh, so we did that for a different kind of gradient for many cells. So that's the good thing about it is that now you can do very something quantitative because you can average out of many cells and uh, add this different gradient. So you see here for rack one, for example, uh, the cells are initially a bit wrong. So of course, they try to protrude a bit on the side. And like as you increase, the, these are just different cells. Yeah? As you increase the sharpness of the gradient, actually, you see that there is a, a transition from something that is more like maybe oriented spreading to something where it's really migration, where the, the actual back of the cells start to move here. Uh, maybe it's even easier to see that uh, with that. So this is the, just the initial position of the cell on the last one. And you see that it's really like there's a gradual change. So that's why it's, it's interesting <coughs> to be competitive here, because there is this really gradual sensing of the cell uh, toward the, the gradient. And one of the things we wanted to ask is uh, what is important in this gradient? Is it the amplitude? Uh, is it the slope of the gradient that matters? And actually, I just summarized that what we found is that it, it's really the extent, you know, how, 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 up to which point in the cell you see some signal. That's the most important thing about this gradient is the extent, the spatial extent, not the amplitude, not the slope. You can change those parameters, it don't, don't change. And then uh, we looked at what was the differences as regard, with regard to the spatial extent, you know, like something that spans the whole cell or very sharp, between CDC42 and RAC1. And uh, it's a bit complicated, I mean, not very good to do the whole thing, but the idea here is that when you look at the cell speed, two coarse gray parameters that describe migration, and directionality, how precise you are when, when you move. Uh, you see that actually RAC1 is really the main driver of speed. Uh, for CDC42, for CDC whatever is the gradient, it moves almost as in the control. Whereas for the, so RAC1 is really the one that propels, <coughs> that, that provides speed to the cell. And uh, actually, for uh, the directionality, it's really CDC42 that is the, dri the, the driver here. Because you see that for sharp, and, he, and for that, you need sharp gradient. Like if you get, get a very sharp gradient of CC42, you see, so this is the data that is interesting, actually. This little point here tells you that your, this is the angular precision, so basically the, the, the higher is this number, the more precise you are, in the, the more sharp is this distribution over the angle that the cell takes. And here you are, the cell is extremely precise in this direction. And we think that actually the, this gradient of uh, rack one is uh, the endogenous one, so the extent that you see in the cell are here for, CC, for RAC1 and here for CC42. You do need a, this sharp CC42 to ensure a good directionality. Whereas this RAC1 is really, you need something that will propel the cell with a, a wider extent of the gradient here. So uh, that's a bit the conclusion that we got on, on that work, you know. I have to say it's a bit stupid. Uh, <laughs> because I don't think the cell is really like that, you know. This is a much, way too <coughs> simplistic vi vision. You should more think about, uh, like, uh, a Boeing cockpit, you know with thousands of buttons and everywhere. That's, I think, how the cells are, because they are, have a much more complicated circuitry. And this is something we're trying to investigate now. But one of the problems, and I will finish with that, uh, is that actually, uh, with all this autogenic activation, the cells start to move. And you know, in, the, in this previous experiment that we did uh, here, for example, you know, we just eliminated a circle here. And you have to think that, you know, three, four frames after the beginning of the movie, the cell is already out of the pattern of light. And then it's over, so it's, uh, you can exploit you know, the first frames and then you're, you're gone. So uh, this is something we, we do now, is actually to try to do this uh, optogenetic feedback. So what the idea is to uh, use the, uh, to segment in light the cell while it's moving, and then to move the stage accordingly. So you can really stay on the cell, and then uh, we want to try to do this activation over uh, hours and even days, if we can make it. You know, so as a challenge, we just think about, let's make a cell dense, you know, so we will draw a little uh, whatever hurt or whatever, or even put music and make the cell dance for a long time, and just see whether or not it works. But um, this is at the beginning, and uh, I will go very quickly on that. But just to give you one movie, for example, of what we get, uh, that's the best we could do, four hours movie, <laughs> not that long, and we made the cell move maybe half of its diameter. Okay, so we are a bit far from the, from the end, but we can segment in live the cell. Uh, we can move the stage, and you see that the, uh, you know, this kind of uh, frame of the microscope is actually moving. So the, the stage is moving, okay, little, but it's moving. Uh, for the moment here, it's just like a, uh, the shape, it's just a square that is moving together with the cell. But of course, since you have this, this mirror, you can really pattern 
it to follow the tip of the cell, and I think this is really important for something that will be in the referential of the cell uh, for this activation region, and uh, hopefully that will work. So with that, I will end, and of course, thanks all the students that were uh, doing that in, in the lab, so they're all uh, presented here, and of course, you for your attention. <laughs>